My name is Martin Stoll. I studied in Leiden classical languages and Assyriology. And uh, after a short career over there, I moved to the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam, where I was professor of Assyriology and Ugaritic. Now I am retired, but still working in the field. My main interests are uh, Old Babylonian, mainly legal and administrative texts, and the second hobby is Babylonian medicine. Could we begin by hearing a bit about the kinds of commentaries that you work on? Um, when were they written? Where were they written? In what languages were they written? By whom, if we know that? Um, why were they written? And on what materials? What do they look like? Well, commentaries are late. The period of the existence of uniform writing is from 3000 BC to the year zero. So that is 3000 years. And uh, only in the last millennium, or even the last 500 years, commentaries arise. Why? Because the languages they spoke and they used in scientific uh, writings were Sumerian, already extinct since 2000 BC, the scientific language, and Akkadian, the language people spoke, until Aramaic intruded, and uh, it was necessary to make commentaries because the Sumerian was not easy. They didn't understand it uh, quite well, but they were very learned, those people. Those were scribes, they had to learn Sumerian, and we have uh, even their dictionaries. In one column, Sumerian, in the second column, the Akkadian equivalent. That is a fantastic tool for us to uh, use in reconstructing Akkadian and Sumerian, the both languages. But uh, even for those uh, Babylonians in the later period, they were uh, important tools too to uh, understand the old Sumerian and the, the Sumerian used over the ages. So they used those texts, we named them lexical texts. And uh, we used them too with much profit and uh, so the commentaries make use of those lexical texts and all other ancient traditions. Um, yeah, that's maybe And they're written on clay tablets in cuneiform script. Yeah, yeah. And how do they survive? How do we have the great good fortune to be able now to study them? There are, uh, they survived because they were written on clay and as soon as a clay tablet had been uh, inscribed in the wet clay, it was dried or even baked in an oven. So, uh, and even when the house went on fire, they were preserved. And for that reason, we have many, many clay tablets. Somebody in Germany computed that there are 260,000 clay tab tablets that have been published. So that is an impossible number. So everybody has to specialize. And you yourself have specialized in medical commentaries. Um, is this a particular genre or is it associated, for example, with astronomical divination texts? Would a Babylonian scribe, for example, have recognized medical commentaries as a specialty unto itself? Yeah, well, there were, there were many more uh, commentaries in those late periods on divination. They did it by extispice, looking at the liver of a young sheep. And uh, there too, they didn't understand anymore the meaning of some passages. And then they made a commentary. So the medical texts um, are of the same type. There is no difference in approach and method. And the main point is they are so associative. Hmm. What and do you mean by associative? When a word reminded you of another word, you uh, thought that they could be related. And when a word was ident identical with another word, with a very different uh, meaning, they even then they thought it was very much akin. So it reflected the same idea. In the Bible, we have that in the story about the Tower of Babel, Babylon. So Babel 
means nothing in Hebrew, but Baalal means to confuse, as in Akkadian, because the language, the Baalal, to the languages are related. So they simply uh, interpreted Babel with Baalal to confuse, and that's why the confusion of languages originated. How did one become a scribe in this culture? And was there a lineage of scribes that corresponded, for example, with a family lineage? How was this knowledge transmitted and, the, and also the, the office of the scribe transmitted? Uh, scribes, the best scribes were the so-called uh, uh, anti-witchcraft specialists in the Akkadian Ashipu, and they had to be a man, belong to a, 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 a family, they have to have a lineage of other uh, anti-witchcraft specialists before them. So it was a very respected job and they had to learn a lot. And they learned that previously we thought that there were schools. Now we know that they were trained at, at home by their fathers and other specialists. And it is unbelievable what they all had to learn and to write down and to copy. And the main thing is, it was very traditional. So the, it, indeed, it, you can follow one line from 2000 uh, BC until the year zero, and it is always the same. And in the late, late periods, the commentaries pop up and uh, are used. We live in a culture which is obsessed with the new with new discoveries, new inventions, new theories. This is, as you say, a highly traditional intellectual culture that looks toward the past and attempts to preserve the past. Can you describe the kind of model of knowledge which underlies these practices. What did they think knowledge was? What did they think? Did they think it grew? Did they think that it accumulated? Um, did they think it ever had to be revised? Um, can we infer from these practices, um, especially the scribal practices, what the ideal of a knowledge tradition was? Well, uh, we don't know. But what we know is that it is all uh, embedded in religion. The, the wisdom of the scribes originates from the gods. It is before the flood, the deluge. It was already there. And the scribes transmit that knowledge, that secret knowledge, to their uh, children, their sons, and so on. And it is highly traditional. But at the end of uh, this uh, Mesopotamian culture, a big uh, surprise originates, and that's in, astro in astronomy. In ast astronomy was already ast astrology, mm -hmm. so prediction. But uh, in the, during the time that they uh, studied astronomy, they discovered the rules of the recurring uh, eclipses, etc and the planet Venus, they were already aware of Venus in 3000 BC as the morning star and the evening star. And then around 500 BC, they, had, uh, they could even predict eclipses. And that uh, was a boost to the uh, authority of astronomy, including astrology. And that astrology expanded in commentaries, a lot of attention is paid to it, and the Greeks took that over. So our uh, astrology is basically Babylonian. Even our 60 minutes within the hour is the sexagesimal accounting system of the old Sumerian, the Sumerians, which continued in, this, uh, ast uh, in these computations of the astronomers and astrologers. So this is really a tradition which is not simply 3,000 years old, but more like 5,000 years old. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much.